welcome to the, um, um, this workshop. We're going to talk about how we can deal with, um, oops, how we can deal with the volume and velocity associated with hundreds of terabytes of genomics data. Um, specifically, we're gonna be talking about terabyte scale gene sequence search uh, to understand what this is and how important this problem is. We're going to go through a um, fairly relevant narrative. So let's say we have some um, mysterious infectious disease, right? And we, the first thing we wanna know is probably whether or not we've actually seen this before or whether it's something completely new. So what do you do? You grab this virus, uh, you, you extract its genes, and you feed it through a machine called a sequencer, which basically spits out the A's, C's, T's, and G's that make up its genome. After that, you would, uh, you would look through um, your repository of all the viruses that you've sequenced before to ask, you know, have I seen this before? Does this look like anything I've seen before? This is what you call sequence search. And formally speaking, um, given a number of documents, each containing the whole genome, uh, gene sequence of a species and a query gene strand, you're supposed to find the documents which contain the query gene strand. Now, um, sequence search isn't just useful to find out about new viruses. It's also useful for phylogenomics, which is the study of comparing genes to study the evolutionary tree, or it's also useful for contact tracing, mapping disease spread, and um, to investigate biological infections. And genomics data as a whole has, been, has done wonders for us, right? And so the rational thing to do is to sequence more data, uh, sequence more organisms. And because of that, there has been the desire to sequence more and more. We have initiated more and more ambitious programs, such as the NIH um, All of Us Research Program, which tries to sequence one million human genomes in order to, um, uh, to advance um, personalized medicine. And we've also developed better sequencing devices. This little thing actually sequences um, fit, uh, four terabytes per run. And so the desire and the capability to, desire, uh, to sequence more and more organisms um, leads us to sequence even more organisms. And that leads us to like just a data deluge, right? Um, the amount of data we have on genomics has increased exponentially. In fact, in fact the um, whole genome shot, shot, shotgun sequencing data actually doubles every seven months. And um, this is just the size of one archive. We have 36 petabytes in this one archive. So just to show you the scale of this size, let's look at your typical laptop memory. You probably have around eight gigabytes of memory on your laptop. And then the Human Microbiome Project, that has around 43 terabytes, so that's 43,000 gigabytes, right? Quite a lot. You can see that you can't really see the, the, the bar um, representing your laptop anymore. And then you have the European Nucleotide Archive, which is about 10 times that. Now you can't see the, the, the bar representing your, your laptop memory anymore. And then you have the SRA, which is like 100 times that. So that's how much data we have. So back to search. Um, we're supposed to find the documents that contains a query strand, but that's really a lot of documents to look through. But wait a second, doesn't Google deal with more than 36 petabytes? Come on, they have to deal with more than 36 petabytes. So there are a couple things that makes uh, gene sequence search um, a different and in some ways more difficult problem than text document search. Um, one of the things is that the documents are just, um, the documents are just bigger in this area. For example, the longest Wikipedia article has a little less than 250,000 characters. Meanwhile, a document containing the whole gene sequence of a, an organism can have around 300, 000, uh, 300 million base pairs. So that's about a thousand times longer, right? The documents are a thousand times longer. So instead of looking through the documents, um, each document, maybe we can do something smarter. Let's say we want to make, let's say we want to make a mapping of, um, from words to documents, and in the case of genome search, maybe we can have an index of DNA strands to documents that contain those DNA strands. But in terms of the, let's say in the English language, we only have 200,000 words or tokens. So we only have to map 200,000 words to whatever documents contain them. While in genomics, even if you have a sequence that is only 20 characters long, there are about one trillion possible combinations of those four characters. So that makes the search space much, much larger. So 
this is a problem that is difficult, but we're going to solve it today. We're going to think of ways that we can solve this. But before that, we will talk about some um, basics, basic techniques that we will be using. Specifically, we will be talking about hashing. OK, so um, is anyone here familiar with hashing? Has anyone heard of the term before? Yeah, um, so where have you heard it being used before? Oh, okay, okay, cool, 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 cool. Okay, so um, today we're going to see how it can help us um, with uh, something like search. So basically, hashing is just give me a number associated with a particular object, and the tool that allows us to get that number is called a hash function. And there are a lot of hash functions out there, and um, they can really range from hashing all sorts of objects, from strings to numbers to, to documents, etc. Uh, a simple hash function is, for example, if you want to hash some text, you can maybe sum up the, um, the numerical encodings of each character, right? That's a way to get some number out of, out of text, for example. So why would we want to get a number in the first place? Formally speaking, hashing, uh, hashing is taking in an object and mapping it to a number h of x in the range 0 to n. And hash functions can have some interesting properties. For example, um, the same object will lead to the same hash value. So what are the implications? Let's take a moment to think about why this is good, right? Um, for example, let's say that I have an object that hashes to one, and I have a different object that hashes to two. I know that the same object will always create the same hash value, so those two objects have to be different. I know just by that number, they're going to be different. Another thing that could be useful is if these objects if different objects hash to different values. Um, this is a likely outcome with regular hash functions, but there is a class of hash functions called perfect hash functions that actually guarantee this. Um, and this is useful because then if two objects have the same hash, uh, hash value, then we know for sure that two objects are going to be the same. Right? How can we use this for search? And how can we make this useful? We're going, to take a, we're going to look at an example where we can make hashing useful, and it's a problem of du duplicate detection. Basically, given a, an array of numbers, let's say, detect and remove the duplicates. The most naive way to do this is, to com uh, is a comparison-based method. So as you look through each element in the array, you look at all the previous elements to see, hey, have I seen this before? If you've seen it before, then it's a duplicate. You mark it, you remove it. Which means that for each of the, um, in the worst case, for each of the elements, you'll have to look through the whole array, which means that you're going to do like order of n squared number of computations, where n is the number of elements in the array. And any questions so far, by the way? Okay, perfect. Next, you also you can also have a sorting-based method where you sort the elements in the array first. And the nice thing about sorting an array is that now all the same numbers are going to be next to each other. So after you sort it, you can just see if, a number, if, there are, if there's more than one of the same number in a row, then it has to be a duplicate. Um, but unfortunately, the fastest sorting method can sort in an order of n log n time. So it's much better, but it's not yet ideal. And then we have hashing-based methods. So let's revisit some of the properties that we talked about before. Let's say we have a perfect hash function that guarantees if you have the same objects, you're going to get the same number out of the hash function. And if you have different objects, then we guarantee that the hash numbers are going to be different. Now, since you can use numbers to index an array, um, let's say you initialize an array that is um, with the length equal to the range of the hash function. And then you will use the numbers that the objects hash to as an index to the array. And then let's say you hash a certain number. You will go to the position um, corresponding to the hash value of that number. And you will change it from 0 to 1 to mark that you've seen it before. So you go through the next number. Again, you go, th uh, you go to the position corresponding to its hash value, and you mark it 1. As you go through the numbers, if you don't see any duplicates, then you're going to go to different buckets each time and see that um, you haven't seen that number before. 
But then if you see the same number, then you're going to see, you're going to hash to a, to a uh, an array element that isn't zero, but is instead one, which is marked that um, you've seen it before. In that case, you can report that it's a duplicate. So in this case, we can see that just we're, we're utilizing the ability to access a memory location very quickly in order to have, uh, in order to detect duplicates in order of one computation. So we'll have a little demo here. Okay, so we're going to have a little experiment, and the experiment setup is this. We have a bunch of strings. Um, we're going to do a similar problem to duplicate detection, but instead of looking for, for duplicates, we're going to be searching for uh, strings in a database. So the setup is this. You have a list of strings um, in a database, and you have a bunch of queries, and for each query, you wanna know whether or not that query is an entry in the database. So let's first generate a, an example database in query. We're just going to do something simple. We're going to be generating random strings. Um, let's set the database size to 15,000. The database is comprised of 15,000 random strings of length 10. And the queries is comprised as half, half of the queries are uh, from the database. The other half are um, other random strings. So let's generate it. Oh, my bad. <laughs> All right, so that's great. Now we have our strings. We have a database and a set of queries. Now we're going to do comparison-based search, which basically says for each of the queries, let's look through the database until we find a matching, uh, matching string. Right? So for, for if you get a query um, and a database, for each entry in the database, you check whether the entry is equal to the query, and then you return true or false accordingly. Let's time it. So it took about six seconds here. It took about six seconds. Um, now we're going to do a hash-based search. We're going to do something, a very simple hash function. We're just going to sum up the numerical encodings of each character in the string. So first, we're going to build the hash array. Now, you may notice that instead of building a, an array of integers like we did before, we're making an array of buckets, an array of arrays inside of it. Now, the reason for this is that we're not using a perfect hash function, right? We know that some, um, we know that different strings may hash to the same value, which means that if, if two different strings hash to the same bucket, we still have to compare them to make sure that they're actually the same string. So, for every entry in the database, we want to hash that entry, and then we want to go to the bucket location, uh, to the, the array location associated with that hash value and append that entry from the database. And then in order to search, when we get a query and we have the hash table or the um, array, uh, we hash that query and go to the location um, according to that hash, and then for each of the entries in that bucket, we will check whether or not the entry is equal to the query. So if we um, benchmark this, so we'll see that this, is, this takes like about, um, that's 40 to 50, between 40 to 50 times faster just by doing that. And this is because we're able to reduce the search space significantly. Instead of having to search through all 15,000 um, 15, entries in the database, now we just have to look through the, the few entries that are in each bucket. Let's take some statistics on this hash, hash table to see whether we can improve it. So we actually had 20,000 buckets in our array. Unfortunately, our hash function is so bad that only 159 of them actually are not empty. And the maximum bucket size is actually 288. So for each bucket that you go to, go to, you still have to look through 288 strings. Well, on average, it's 94, so it's a little bit better. Now, let's try to use a better hash function called MurmurHash. It's developed at Google, so it's good. I don't really know what's going on in there, but it's good, and one of the things that it does is, with a high probability, if you have different objects, it goes to different hash values. So let's run it now. 
And we got another, um, what is that? Tw no, that's like a five times speed up, I think. Five times speed up, right? And let's run some statistics. Oh, apparently now the maximum bucket size is only six and 10,000 of them are non-empty. Um, so we reduced the search space from 15,000 to just six. And that's how we are able to get a um, five times, uh, like a 200x speed up compared to comparison-based methods. Um, but as you can see, even though I reduced this, uh, the search space from 94, um, 94 with the, the bad hash function to six with a good hash function, you can't really get too much better than this because of the other overheads like um, accessing memory and so on and so forth. So we can see how having hash functions can help with search, but we only gave you an example of um, exact search, right? So you only want to search for strings that are exactly the same. What if you want to search for something that is sort of the same but not quite? So for example, let's say if we want near duplicates. In sequence search, we might want a sequence that is, that is only different by one character, for example. Um, or as a toy example, we want 1.001 to be considered a duplicate of one. Can we think of a way that we can do this? Maybe we can just um, design a little hash function which says if, it's, um, if the difference is less than 0.5, um, you basically um, hash each real, real number to the closest um, whole number, right? But this doesn't really satisfy what we really want, which is that if I have um, h of x plus a small delta, then it has to, it has to give me the same value as h of x. Because then you can think of it as like, a, um, like if 1.001 has to hash the same value as 1.002, it has to hash the same value as 1.003, and so on. Now every number hashes to the same value, right? And that's not useful at all. So we need something better, and that something better is called locality-sensitive hashing. I think we can take a short break first, or do you want to go straight into it? All right, sounds good. Thanks, Jordy. Um, my name is Ben, and I am going to talk about locality-sensitive hashing as soon as I figure out the computer controls. <laughs> All right, so uh, locality sensitive hashing. What we just saw was an example of using hash functions to reduce, reduce the search space. And we saw that this got like a 20 or 50x speed up over just brute force search. But if we want to search with approximate matches, instead of doing exact matches, we need to have a more clever kind of hash function than we just saw. This clever kind of hash function is called a locality sensitive hash function. And we're gonna motivate this with a couple of uh, important problems. So the, the first problem that we use to motivate LSH is really large scale search problems. Uh, you could think that perhaps you are running a social media service and you'd like to block certain kinds of images uh, for the purposes of today's talk, these images are images of minions, but I'm sure you can come up with much better examples where this would be used in practice. Now, people are not going to use the same image of a minion everywhere. Uh, you're gonna see some of them are, are gonna look one way, some of them are gonna look another way, but they're all generally going to be small, yellow, and annoying. So uh, you're gonna have to search through the whole, the whole catalog of images to ban all of these minions, just like we saw brute force search before. And if you try to do this, because of the number of images you're going to have to search through, it's going to quickly become infeasible. Um, if you're at Facebook, they have about 10,000 terabytes of images. And uh, as of last month, the largest AWS instance you can rent has 12 terabytes of RAM. And that's, uh, that's, that's a big difference. So you can't do the search. Um, the, the second problem that we're, that we're interested in here are real-time search problems. So before we saw a memory limitation, but now we're going to see a time limitation. In, in this case, um, we, we have a large database of, of items that we'd like to search through, and we want to do it quickly. You can think of this as spell-correcting a, uh, a, a user-typed query in real-time. 
maybe you're running Google search or Amazon product search, and somebody types a query with uh, you know, a, a slight typo. Now, you could do a, a near similarity match by brute forcing over the entire list of English words, but this is gonna end up being very expensive. It'll take about five minutes on a, on a reasonable machine. To maintain the illusion that web services are instantaneous, we have to have about 20 milliseconds of latency on a, on a production service, so we need a clever so search solution. The truth is, uh, what, what these problems boil down to is something called near neighbor search. We are looking for items in the database which are nearest in terms of some reasonable similarity metric to the thing that we are querying. In the case of the social media service, we want to find images like that annoying minion. In the case of you know, fixing your typos, we want to find a, a query that's close to what you typed. But there's no way to solve this near neighbor search problem in high dimensions in reasonable time. You can't find the exact solution quickly. There are theoretical proofs that say you cannot do this. So we have to relax the problem to an approximate version where maybe we're only finding the exact match at 90 something percent of the time. There's about 60 years of research that's gone into this problem. Um, LSH is only one solution for many to do this. Uh, but it's a very good solution, and we're going to talk about it today because it's used widely in genomics. So the idea here is that we're going to use hashing, like we did for exact duplicate detection, but now we're going to use it to group similar points together. Giordi's example from before about why we can't just construct one hash function that does this perfectly, it, it, it explains the problem pretty well. But we're gonna take a closer look with a more concrete example now. So uh, in, in this situation, we would like input x, where x is a real number, uh, and input x plus a very small delta to go to the same memory location, to have the same hash code. And you know, we'll quickly see that this is not really possible. Specifically, um, if these two things need to happen, then it needs to happen for x equals x plus delta. And, and so all of these collapse into one hash function, or one, one hash output, as we talked about before. Um, this can't be solved with the deterministic hash function, just isn't going to happen. So the, the solution here is to migrate to a probabilistic kind of guarantee. Instead of saying these two inputs collide into the same hash bucket all of the time, we're gonna say these two inputs collide into the same hash bucket most of the time. And as long as it happens frequently enough, we're still getting the same kind of uh, candidate matching you know, capability that we talked about earlier. So one, one easy way for this example is when you create the hash function, pick a random number. Add this small random number to, uh, you know, some function of the input and round it to an integer. And when we do this, uh, this will probabilistically, based on that random number, collide x and x plus 0 .001. Um, <clears throat> of course, there will be inputs x and x plus 0 .001, which fall right on the boundary of that random number decision threshold. But you can think that over the, the series of random numbers that we could possibly pick and the inputs that we could possibly have to the hash, this probably doesn't happen too much. Of course, if x and y are two very different integers, very far away from each other, then they're probably not going to go to the same number, at least not under this hash function. So the, the generalization of this idea is locality-sensitive hashing. Um, and locality-sensitive hashing works for more than just real-valued inputs, like we saw before. The function that we just saw is a locality-sensitive hash function, but there are many other options to pick from. Uh, to kind of get an intuitive sense of how this all works, I, I like to use this picture. Um, it, it takes the dots, which are elements in our collection, and it maps them to hash buckets. And so what you can see is, in the LSH table, the similar colored objects 
all go to similar buckets. So the red ones all go to bucket one, the blue ones are all in bucket three, and you'll see that this, this is not a perfect partitioning. There's a, uh, a green item in bucket four, which probably shouldn't be there. That one got unlucky and happened to span one of those randomly decided partition boundaries. But you're certainly doing much better than with an ordinary hash table, where the assignments are essentially random. So now that we have this idea of LSH, let's take a look at what it can be used for. Um, it, we'll, we'll see later in the context of genomics, but first let's just look at search. Um, we would like to use this in a similar fashion to doing that exact duplicate detection that Giordi talked about earlier. But before we get to that point, let's talk about how we construct and, and play with LSH functions. So before, we saw that if two inputs have the same LSH code, they produce the same LSH value, that means that they're similar in some sense. Uh, X and X plus .001 go to the same hash bucket most of the time. But there's a, also a possibility, you'll remember from our picture here, that some of those points in the same bucket aren't actually similar. We could have gotten unlucky. So how do we minimize the chance of, uh, of having this happen? We use more than one hash function. If, if there's a small chance that one hash function accidentally collides two things we don't want. There's an even smaller chance that two hash functions independently both collide those same two things. And this is called boosting. What we do is we construct two hash functions which are stronger when concatenated together. Um, and what this will do is it will create an even stronger indication that those two items are similar. Now, when we do this, uh, we can do it many times. We could do it with k separate hash functions. We could repeat this process. Uh, but what I'd like to point out is that there is a limit to the, to the k that we can reasonably pick. Uh, why is this? Because every time we do this intersection, uh, what, what we're doing is we're, we're essentially saying we, we need these hash functions to all be the same for two things to collide into that bucket. And that, that's kind of bad if you do this a very large number of times, because at some point, you'll end up with empty buckets, or buckets with very, very low populations. So typically, we only do it a relatively small number of times, maybe two to, to 10 times, depending on the hash function. But every time you, you, can, you add another hash function, you, you create a stronger indication that two items are the same or, or very similar. Now, the next thing that we can do is a direct response to the problem of having too few items in our buckets. And the, the solution here is to just make more tables. So if I have one LSH table constructed with uh, this k concatenated hash function, I could repeat this process again. If my, if my object collides with nothing in the first hash table, maybe there's a chance that it'll collide with something in the second hash table. And so by increasing the repetitions of the hash tables, we increase the number of things that, uh, the number of candidate matches that we can look for to ensure that by doing this re re repetition process, we uh, don't accidentally back ourselves into a corner where we've matched nothing from the data set. So now that we've got these two ideas, we can introduce what we call the LSH similarity search algorithm. This is an algorithm that's been around for about 20 years. Uh, it's uh, introduced in 1998, so it's uh, very, very well studied. It has some very nice theoretical properties too. But in practice, what you're gonna do is you're just gonna pick a K and an L for your application. K is the number of hash concatenations, and L is the number of tables that you're going to search through. And you're going to take all of the items from your collection, all of those images from the image problem, or all of the type untypoed queries from the query correction problem, and you're going to hash those, those items and stick them into the bucket pointed to by the hash function. And you'll do this uh, L different times. You'll make a bunch of different hash tables. 
Then when you query, remember, if two items have the same hash code, it means that they're probably similar. So what we're going to do is we're going to hash that query. We are going to go to that bucket in the table, and that bucket is probably going to contain things that are close to the query because the bucket had similar items in it. It had the same hash code. So uh, we take the union of all of the items across all of the tables, and we explicitly compute the similarities with those items. Just as before, we've reduced the search space from a brute force search over all of the possible items to now a, a winnowed search over just a smaller collection of items that are in those matching buckets. The intuition here is the, exactly the same as before with the exact duplicate detection problem, except now we have this additional element of randomness in the hash function. The query is going to return points from the data set where all of the LSH values are the same. So if we just use one hash table, there's a, pro there's a possibility that we might miss out on some points that maybe collided with k minus one of the hashes, but got unlucky and didn't collide on the last one. So by using L tables, we produce a large enough candidate set that we can you know, check a substantially large part of the data set without checking more than is necessary. Um, and you know, if you choose the best point across all the tables, this is likely to be the, the closest um, similarity point in the data set. This can be much, much faster than explicit checking. And uh, yeah, so, so one, one question that you may have at this point is how do we build these LSH functions? I've been implicitly imagining that I just have this magical function that probabilistically collides things when they're similar. How, how do I make that happen? There's a lot of very well studied LSH functions. The one that is most relevant to uh, genomics is minhash, which works for the Jacquard similarity. So the Jacquard similarity, just as a quick refresher, is a similarity score defined over the set of, over the space of sets. If I've got two sets, S1 and S2, uh, the Jacquard similarity is the size of their intersection divided by the size of their union. So let's just do a quick thought experiment. If the two sets are the same, uh, their intersection will be whatever their intersection is. Uh, their union will also be the same thing. Um, and so this comes out to be uh, exactly one. If the two sets are totally disjoint, then no matter what their union is, their intersection is zero. So uh, the similarity between two disjoint sets is zero. And then if the two sets share some elements but have some elements that aren't shared, uh, this is go the similarity score is going to measure the fraction of elements that are uh, in, present in both sets. So uh, you can see the simple example here. Uh, if we have the sets 3, 10, 15, 19, and then S2 is 4, 10, 15, that you can see that the elements 10 and 15 are shared between the two sets. So the size of the intersection is two, and the size of the union ends up to be five, and so you get kind of a half and half similarity score here. How do, how do we use this for genomics? Well, we, we take n grams of the string. So if I've got uh, the string iPhone 6, I'm going to break that into all of the character n-grams that, that compose that. So you can, I'm, I'm not gonna talk through all of them, but you can see them on the screen. There, uh, there's quite a few. The Jacquard distance between two strings is going to be small if there's only a couple of items in the strings that are different. Uh, and this is just because some of those n-grams are going to be different, but not too many. Uh, and this is useful for things like spell correction. You can see here I've mistyped the word Amazon uh, several times. And, um, you know, the Jacquard distance is relatively large in the case of proper typo corrections. Whereas for completely different words, they have disjoint n-grams and we end up with a zero similarity score. Uh, I would just like to say too that uh, the, there is an LSH function for Jacquard similarity. Uh, imparting the intuition behind this function 
might take a little bit longer than we have to talk about, but I'm gonna try. So uh, given two sets, S1 and S2, we have an LSH algorithm called minhash. And uh, minhash has this property that the collision probability, that is the chance that two items go to the same hash bucket, that probability is exactly the jacquard similarity. So if I've got two strings and they have jacquard similarity 0.5, and I compute min hash values with a hundred different, you know, instances of the min hash hash function, I'd expect about half of them to send these two strings to the same place. Now, what is min hash doing inside? I'm not 100% sure that we have a slide on this, but I'm gonna tell you anyway. Um, min hash is picking one of the elements from the set and checking whether it is in both sets. It's doing this with fancy, uh, fast hash tricks. But what it's really doing is it's, it's checking both sets, picking a random item from the vocabulary of items that you have in, in your set space, and it's checking to see if that's present in both. And it turns out that over an appropriate random selection of that item to check, the collision probability is exactly the Jacquard similarity. It's the fraction of items shared by those sets. There are many, many other LSH functions. Uh, we don't have time to talk about all of them, but if you are interested in things like the cosine distance, you can use signed random projections. You can use uh, what's called a p-stable LSH function for things like the Euclidean distance and the Manhattan distance, the L1 and L2 distances in, in uh, RD. We've also got uh, bit sampling, which estimates the Hamming distance, and if you are interested in a similarity score that is not defined explicitly by a distance function, but is rather defined by uh, behavioral patterns. For example, two pictures of me or a picture of me and something that I associate closely with, like Rice University. You can use something called a learned LSH function, which learns to partition those items in such a way that similar items will usually go to the same location. And at this point, we have a demo of LSH, which I'm gonna let Josh take over for. Thanks, Ben. Um, so let me, I gotta figure out how to, the sharing thing works here. Uh, wow. um, I think that should work. Um, okay, so this is the same, so this is kind of the same uh, idea as the original hashing demo, except now we're gonna do the same thing uh, for near duplicate detection. Uh, so locality sensitive hashing. Um, so first we'll import, uh, I find, import some things. So the general idea that we're, that we're gonna be doing here is we're going to be building the LSH tables that we discussed before using the LSH algorithm, except, and we're going to be doing it over, we're gonna index like a bunch of words from the English dictionary. Uh, so we're gonna index, you know, maybe the first, the first 10,000 most common words. And then we're gonna do this exact same example we saw on the slides. So we're gonna have like typos in those words. And then we're gonna search those in the LSH table uh, to try to find the nearest neighbors. You know, basically the correct version of the words. And you can see how kind of this, uh, you know, how this is similar to, to DNA search uh, because you might wanna search for corrupted sequences, you know, in a table of, of uh, like all kind of like known sequences say. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna define some helper functions. Um, this first one, uh, get engrams just returns kind of the set of engrams that Ben talked about. So, you know, a three you'll return the set of three grams, so all the all the trigrams in the word, so the sets of three letters in a row. Um, you know, four would be the sets of four or whatever. Um, and then also we're just defining min hash, which Ben mentioned there. You know, it's actually a pretty simple, short uh, implementation, but that's basically, you know, like Ben was saying, it's it tries to the it, it estimates the Jacquard similarity and just returns a number that collides. Uh, you know, if two sets are, are have similarity J, then, then the number that gets returned from this, uh, this function that operates on their set of uh, trigrams will, it will uh, collide, you know, equal to the percent of time, equal, equal to their similarity of their uh, trigram representation, say. Um, and then, sure, this will just, um, just compute the Jacquard similarity um, between two sets. So we'll, we'll, we'll run this, which is kind of setting up some nice uh, helper functions for us. And this is the uh, LSH class. So this is kind of the other big idea that we just talked about. This is, you know, those uh, uh, L tables that each have 
pay hash values in them. And this just implements both the indexing step there, uh, which is right here, uh, inserting, and also looking up, like doing a query. Um, and actually, you know, these slides will be available. You guys can feel free to come look at this code. It's, you know, it's, it's Python, and it should be relatively understandable. Um, okay, so like I promised, now we're gonna download a dictionary of English words. Uh, this is just a word list and, uh, you know, from MIT or whatever, that just has the first 10,000 most common words. Um, so that just takes really short downloads. And then here what we're gonna do is we're going to generate queries. So like, like, I'm, like I mentioned, our queries are actually uh, just normal words, but basically with one character messed up. Um, so I'll run this really quick. Um, and you can see here are some of the database words. You know, these are, some of these might not look like English words, but I guess they're in the, uh, you know, the Scrabble dictionary of words. <laughs> they're, they're, they're not perfect English words, but they're, they're you know, this is basically our database. And then here are the words that are messed up. So you can see, you know, instead of academy, we have academy. And the idea is that when you query academy, hopefully it returns academy, right? Um, and you don't want to have to look over the entire dictionary of words. And so now we have our, our queries. So we're going to initialize the uh, LSH table. This takes a little bit of time because we're, we're inserting uh, all of the elements into k times l uh, hash tables, but this is kind of the indexing step. We don't really care if this takes uh, a long time because you know, maybe if you have a, a billion genomic sequences, well, you can spend like you know, uh, a few weeks of computer time inserting these all into a big index, but then you have this index and you can query it very quickly. So it takes 15 seconds to insert the keys. Um, and now we're gonna do a, a brute force comparison search for these queries. And we're gonna see how long that takes. Uh, and, and you know, it's not gonna be, it's gonna take a bit of time because we're you know, doing a brute force comparison of the chart similarity between all 10,000 words in the database and all of our 100 queries. You can see that took about five seconds. Now the LSH based time, takes uh, 0.3 seconds. And so it's much faster. And uh, we don't have the accuracies here, but, but the accuracy is actually very good. You know, it might not be, you might not find the exact nearest neighbor 100% of the time, uh, but usually you'll find pretty good neighbors. So actually down here, we can see, you know, this is like a, 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 te a query word here. And you can see it finds, uh, this, is, this is doing the LSH lookup, and the words it's findings uh, are, are actually very close. So if we do, you know, this, this one I talked about earlier, if we search for this, you know, it, the first result that, that LSH returns is Academy. So it is, it is doing a pretty good job, and it's a very fast query. Um, and the last thing here we can look at is we can kind of look at, so the, the idea here is, you know, what is the average similarity of the points we're, 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 measure, we're, we're looking at? Because if the average similarity is high, it means that, okay, you're choosing a subset of the data set that is good. You're, you're looking for near neighbors in words that actually are similar. So we're looking at this LSH bucket. And with the LSH method, the average similarity in the LSH buckets is 0.02. The average similarity across the whole data set is 10 times smaller, or yeah, 10 times smaller. So basically what, what this is saying is that if you use the LSH method, you're gonna get a candidate set that's 10 times better than just choosing a random set from the data set, um, which is really good because it's basically a really, really quick way to eliminate a large swath of the data set. Um, anyways, that's, that's the end of this demo. And like I said, you know, this is, you guys you feel free to check this out afterwards. It's got a nice, uh, well, here's a fun application. Um, and it's not quite the promised you know, DNA sequences yet, but that's coming in a teensy bit. This is also actually a really cool application and it has cats. It's the classic machine learning uh, uh, the object of uh, demos. So first, you know, a brief history lesson, really, really fast, don't worry. Um, LSH methods, like the ones we just described, were developed you know, around 20 years ago, and they really reigned supreme as the best near neighbor search algorithm uh, for about 10 or 15 years, until like the mid to er early mid to the 2010s, when there were basically this, this whole kind of new class methods that came out, like graph-based search methods that basically take all the neighbors, all, all the points in the data set and construct like a, a, a graph out of them, a computer science graph of like, you know, points and see which edges. And the idea is you, if you're doing indexing, you connect all the points in the data set to their closest neighbors, and then you kind of traverse this graph when you have a query. Um, and this, it worked pretty well, and so a lot of the big uh, search indices that you might use are, you know, if you have Spotify and you have a, a song, you want to find similar songs. Spotify will use a graph-based method. 
to find the similar problem. Um, but it really, that really method does not really work well for huge high dimensional data like DNA or images, high, high dimensional images. Because in order to traverse this graph, you have to do a bunch of distance computations. And even a single distance computation between two DNA sequences, you know, if they're both really, really long DNA sequences, that could take a sizable amount of time. Um, so basically, we were le you're left in the position where, well, LSH doesn't work that great, classic LSH doesn't work that great, but there's really nothing that works well for high dimensional search. So we need a new method. And uh, this, is, this is kind of the return of LSH. Um, you know, this flash published from Rush Lab at Rice uh, is basically LSH, but no distance computation. Instead of returning this candidate set and then computing the distance against all of the return neighbors, what you do is you return the candidate sets and just, you know, return the, and count how often each point in the candidate set is returned. Because if you have 100 or 200 LSH tables, you know, points are similar, they're going to be, if points are, you know, 90% similar, they're going to be in, they're going to be on 9 out of 10 of those tables. And so the insight is that, well, you don't actually have to compute all the distances. What you do is a proxy to see how often do they, do they, are they in the candidate, return candidate set. And it turns out that's much faster. Um, and it's actually the current state of the art for high dimensional search. Um, so let me do a quick demo. It's not going to be DNA because unfortunately DNA is not so visually exciting. Um, but I, it is going to be images. Uh, and Im images are also high dimensional. Um, you know, an image might be 200 pixels by 200 pixels, which the input there is 200 times 200, which is, you know, what, 40,000, uh, which is pretty high dimensional. But uh, actually, it turns out that the, that the way people usually deal with images is they take some sort of embedding of the image. Because a raw image, it's kind of hard for a search index or a, to build an LSH function that actually finds a distance between two raw images. So what you do instead is you embed the images into some other space. And that embedding is basically turning all the images into vectors. And if the vectors are close together, it means that the images are similar. Um, and it, you know the way that, that, that I'm going to show the example, uh, it's using this data set called ImageNet, which is uh, this data set of you know, uh, more than a million images. And there are a bunch of machine learning models that classify those images into uh, different categories. And the embeddings that I'm going to use are just some of those uh, models they're kind of like the second to last layer they have there, which it turns out, for lots of weird reasons, work well as embeddings. OK, so now what I have to do is show you this demo. So it's, this demo is actually going to uh, successfully show, um, like show the images that we're querying. So I have to run it on my laptop because it's got about you know, 300 gigabytes of images. Because it's got a million images, and each one uh, is pretty big. So, multiple megabytes. Um, so yeah, so what's the idea here? Well, first, we're just going to import a bunch of stuff. Not so important. Then what we're going to do is we're going to insert, I've pre-generated the embeddings because they take a while to generate, especially if you're not using the GPU. So I pre-generated the embeddings and store them on my computer. I'm just going to insert them all into this flash index. And remember, the flash index is basically LSH, but you do uh, counting. Um, so it's ins inserting them all in there it takes you know maybe around a minute or a little bit less to insert all 40 gigabytes. So it's pretty quick. You know, this is pretty fast indexing. Um, and you know, my laptop, too. So this will be done in a bit. Uh, and again, basically what this is doing is taking all million or whatever images, uh, taking their embeddings, and inserting, inserting them into uh, the LSH tables. And actually, something I didn't mention is that we're using sign random projections, which is one of those LSH methods we touched on earlier. But basically, it just estimates the angular distance between points. OK, so that's indexed. We're going to build this, this model, which we need to actually embed the query. And now, OK, here's, here's the image we're going to query the, uh, the, our, our index with. So this is the image. You know, we're going to embed it to, so it's kind of in the same space as the things we already have in the index. And then now we're just going to search it. And as you can see, it returns pretty similar images. Um, a bunch of other cats that are doing about the same thing, which actually is great. And down here, you know, that took uh, point, uh, a hundredth of a second. If we run it again, it's actually even faster because it's already warmed up, CPU is warmed up. So it's, it's very fast. If we actually brute force search over all the images in the data set, well, that's going to take about 30 seconds. And that's pretty slow, especially if you're trying to be Google and return images almost instantaneously when you do a reverse image search. So, you know, 
this is actually really great because uh, it basically allows really fast searching and, and this, these ideas can easily be extended to DNA sequencing because it's the, the same exact type of idea. You have really big DNA sequences and you want to find similar DNA sequences. If you have an index of pre-generated hash values, then you just take your, your query DNA sequence, get the hash values, and look in the data set to find similar sequences. It's just not as visually fun. So this is the actual top neighbor. And you can see we didn't return it in our first five or so results. But the results we returned are all actually really good. It's not that we're returning bad neighbors and we can return 50 if we want. And then you see kind of the, the top neighbor is in the top 10. So it does do a pretty good job of searching. It might not return the top neighbor as number one, but it does return it at, at uh, some point. Now, just to show you this doesn't only do cats, I have a few other uh, examples. So here's a picture of a mountain. Uh, and let's do this. And look, it returns pictures of the mountain. And I just want to emphasize, these are all pictures on my computer. Uh, and it's doing this search over more than a million images really fast. It's basically searching for the embedding, finds the IDs that correspond to the images, just looks up those images on disk and shows them. Um, the last image I'll show, I don't want to go through too, too much of this, but uh, a fun one. This is actually my cat. Just to show you I'm not uh, <laughs> pre-planting the image. This is actually my cat. And uh, let's, see what, let's see what the machine learning model thinks. And look at that. It actually returns a pretty visually, visually similar cat to my cat. And you can see, you know, it's not actually just returning pictures of cats. Like, if the cat, if the cat looked, you know, the first picture was the cat staring directly at the camera and returned a bunch of pictures of the cat staring directly at the camera. And this picture is kind of like a, you know, he's curled up in a, in a ball, and, and it's similar pictures here. So, you know, these embeddings are not just saying cat. They're saying they have more information somehow. Okay, enough about cats. Uh, let's go back to uh, sharing here. Okay, so let's talk about the genome data. Uh, so, uh, Thanks, Jordi. Actually, there was a like initial overview of the germ data, and let's revisit that again. Uh, so, what uh, DNA sequencing is? The uh, sequencing, as the name suggests, is actually reading the DNA of the given species. So, uh, this is the sequencing machine. We don't know what's going on there. We don't need to know. Uh, and we have a bacteria or a virus or any species. It just reads the DNA sequence and spits out this giant, big uh, string. It can be uh, 300 million in size. Now, if it is stored in a text format, it can be approximate 280 megabytes. This is just for one single species. And we can have, uh, I mean, so there has been advance, advancement on this tool. Now, the sequencing machine is uh, very fast, and the cost of the sequencing also declined. So, and there we have, uh, we have this need to actually sequence many, many species. And because of this, uh, what we see is this a uh, rapid increase in the archives. So uh, if you see on this, on, on this graph also, the y-axis is on the log scale. And if you see every every year, it, I mean, it's every like two years, almost like a 10 times jump in that. So uh, as of 2016, the ANA archive is totally 170 terabytes, which is the all the E. coli bacteria that they've sequenced. Okay, so uh, the problem of sequence search is what we're discussing, and the sequence search means we are given this string of genes uh, signature, some uh, a small string that you need to probe, and we just want to know uh, in which species it is present in, basically that's it. So, uh, but the problem is we have this giant uh, string, which is 300 million in length, and we have k such species and we need to search through all of them. Okay, so to define this problem, because this is analogous to what a document uh, search, uh, document indexing problem is, uh, we take the similar route. Now, each, uh, each of this DNA sequence of suppose uh, one species, we actually take this entire uh, DNA sequence, and we convert it into a document. A document is merely the set of uh, of the parts of the DNA sequence. What's going on there is, uh, suppose we have this long string. What we do is we take the uh, k k mers or k grams of it. Now the k here is 31 length. 31 length ensures actually 
the the optimum length to to actually optimally represent this entire long sequence. It should not be too short because we only have four base pairs. It doesn't make any sense. It should not be too long because it doesn't give any freedom to the user for the search. So now we have uh, these schemas, and each document is a set of these schemas. And uh, we can query the schema and then see in which document it lies in. It will just give the species. OK, so now uh, the first thing that comes into my mind is, uh, OK, how can we index this, and how can I approach this problem? So we all know limited index. I mean, if we even don't know, it's uh, actually basically we can use a hash table for that. Uh, the keys are the different k-mers that are possible. And the buckets against the keys are all the documents that contains that key. The thing is, uh, we have 31 length camera. That means 4 to the power 31th possible combinations. And that is almost 10 to the power 18 combination. It is billion times billion. I don't even know what that, <laughs> what to call that. So even if we say the possible camera uh, is uh, 1,000 times of the entire search space, 10 to the power 15 again, it's like uh, too much. I mean. <laughs> More than trillions, trillions of cameras. So this, that's why the the index becomes so big. And even if we have like hundred uh, species, it can go up to more than five hundred GPs. This is what we can afford. Another trivial solution is that it's like the forward index approach. We search through all the files. So uh, we have k files, and we do string match the brute force string match on each and every file. Now, uh, that is like simple uh, using a grep command, uh, take this camera and search in the, into the file. Now, if you just search one file, it takes approximately 0 .0, like 76 milliseconds. Now, that means for 100 files, it's 7.6 uh, 7 seconds. Uh, for 1,000 files, it is 76 seconds. And if you have half a million files, it's like eight hours. I cannot wait for eight hours for just one camera uh, query. At least I cannot. <laughs> so uh, this is where uh, we have an approach. Uh, so in the left, we see this set of gamers. And we have a membership tester. So what membership tester does is uh, given a gamer in your hand, you go to the membership tester. It will say, OK, the gamer is present in the set or not. So this set is a document or the species that I'm calling. And membership tester will just say yes or no. Now, this membership tester is, uh, we don't need to know what's happening there, actually. Uh, it's sort of like a binary string. It will, again, so uh, sort of like takes the hash of the camera and uses that to actually say if it is present in the set or not. So it's a basically compressed version of the set. Now the compression is actually, if the set size is almost 500 MBs in total, it can achieve up to 77, 770 KBs, like 60x compression. And one best thing about this, about this is, uh, it is not a brute force search, it's a constant time lookup. Like in an instant, it will tell you if you are there in the set or not. I mean, in a funny way, sort of like the guy uh, outside the club, and you're just going to get your membership card and then, OK, ask, OK, am, am I in the club or not? I'll say, no, you're not. <laughs> OK, so I mean, there are uh, various uh, membership test utilities that we know. Uh, these are all some bloom filters, counting bloom filters. I mean, in our experiment, we use bloom filters. Yeah. If interested, we can talk about that. Now, can we make a search engine out of it? Now, that's the question. Uh, anyone? Can we? Pretty simple. <laughs> yeah, so what we do for one, we can do for k of them. Right? So yeah, now we have k membership testers. And our camera goes to each and, each and every one of them, asking if this camera is there in that or not. OK, so yeah, some may allow, some may not. Whichever, that allow, whichever allows is, is, is the document that the camera is present in. 
So yes, there are k membership traces, so the complexity will be order of k. Uh, so this uh, pretty simple algorithm. The membership testers are uh, pretty efficient, and uh, it's, it is actually the 2019 Nature paper uh, implemented on genomic uh, data sets and the state of the art method of 2019. In fact, not even in genomics, in Bing search engines, this was used. And it is uh, actually not based on inverted index, but based on these membership testers using bit slash signatures. Very similar concept. Okay, so uh, this is the story till, till now, but uh, can we do something better? Now, the query complexity is order of k. Can we make it uh, less than order of k? Any thoughts? Now, this is the interesting part. Well, I mean, uh, all these membership testers, you can actually parallelly probe. So yeah, one very brute force way to make parallel membership testing. But yeah, I mean like uh, this is, we if you're limited by hardware and this is not a scalable solution. If we can have like a, an innovative trick, which is sub in K and still parallel. So what we can do? Okay, so we can uh, actually do a random grouping of the set. So now these dots represent each set. Uh, so say one dot is equal to bacteria one, other dot is actually equal to bacteria two, the virus and all these things. Now what I do is I randomly group some of them into one giant set, okay? And the other one, and the third one. Oh, here are membership testers. Okay, so we randomly group uh, into three sets in expectation that each grouping is of you know, similar cardinality. Means, say, if there are uh, 100 of the sets, then almost 33, 34, 35 goes into each one of them. Now, if we actually uh, ask these three membership testers, it will give, okay, at least, so one will say, yes, you are present in that one. So what we gained is, we actually reduce our search space from K, 100, to K over three. But, I mean, we still only reduce to k over three, we need to pinpoint which set present in. Now, is there any idea what else we can do? Okay. Repeat the process, basically. So take another random grouping and take the intersection. Now, what we do is we have another, uh, three uh, groups, we put using a different grouping method. The grouping should not be same into these three. Now we have uh, six membership testers. A gamer will go to these three of them. Say one or maybe multiple of them will say, okay, you are in here, means you are present in this group of set. The other sets will say, okay, you are present in third group of sets. Then I take the intersection between these two. And whatever sets I get here, these intersections, will be our candidate set. So we reduce the search space from k over three to k over nine using two repetitions. Three repetitions, k over 27, and that's all. So it's exponential reduction in search space with linear increase in the membership testers. Okay, so this is what uh, we call our algorithm Brambo. <laughs> so <laughs> it's repeated and merged, and Bloom filter is a membership testing utility that we use. So each of these is uh, membership testers. And in this example, B is number of membership tests in one table, and R is the number of repetitions. Okay, in, in case of streaming, means if the, the the sequence of the each species coming one by one, then what we can do, we can use a hash function. So this can be a universal hash function. We can actually hash this set into, I mean, it actually randomly locates the set into one location. 
this into some other random location. So what it is doing is say we have a k means 100 sets and we have b means 10 groups. So approximately each group will be, uh, will have approximately 10 sets. K and I find k. So this is our uh, Rambo array uh, basically. Now, uh, what benefits is like uh, we have uh, cheap updates because uh, we can actually use streaming inputs and then we can update using this hash, hash function. Uh, it's a very embarrassing parallel because again, that means we have B cross R membership tester and we can parallelly actually ask them, am I in this club or not? Okay, and uh, the index size is lower because the compression rate that we saw in membership tester reflects here. Okay, so during query, what we do is we actually take the union in one repetition and do the intersection across all the repetitions. And we did the math. Uh, the number of repetitions that we need is order of the number of uh, files, order of uh, the log of number of files. And the number of uh, membership tests in one table we need is root of 10. This, so how many how many uh, membership testings? Root k log k, which is less than order of k. Like just to give an idea, uh, the uh, order of k, like say we have k is equals to uh, a million, right? So root k log k will be what? Like uh, 6,000, max 10,000 or something. Now if it is like say a billion, so maybe Okay, what, 50,000, uh, 100,000? So as we go, as we go uh, more and more, uh, we don't see that effect gain and effect in uh, this order of k log k. Okay, uh, yeah, so if you want to like to check the paper and the code, uh, you can use this uh, QR and, and the link. And uh, meanwhile, we can actually just see how, uh, we just run the Rambo uh, on some genome sequence. It might not be, like it won't be as visually appealing. <laughs> not sure if I can use my chat. Uh, chat so yeah, uh, basically, uh, uh, if you just see our query set, something like this. So we have all these queries, we are passing the 10,000 of them. And then uh, you see, so we have, uh, so we have created a, 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 a Rambo on uh, 1,000 files. It's like, a, that is approximately, uh, okay, that's a bit one sided to admit, but it's approximately uh, 3 trillion of the k-mets. So we have indexed the k-mets, it takes approximately like 20 minutes uh, to index, and that's what we are showing here. So yeah, any, any more query that we can put, or we can actually put uh, the entire 10,000. Okay, so it's almost taking like 0 0.08 milliseconds of query. Really fast, I mean. almost like 10 to the power minus 5 seconds per kill. Now, uh, that means, uh, I mean, I'm assuming a scenario uh, where we need to actually see uh, in the entire genome of, like a ge after sequencing, 300 million uh, KMS that we have. So 300 million is approximately times uh, 50 microseconds is what, 300 seconds? So that is like under an hour. I mean, if there's any anomaly detection that we need to do in the sequence, we can re get report in under an hour now. Pretty quick. It used to take days. Okay, and even we can uh, use some some of the. So what it does is actually gives out uh, the candidate. Uh, if you get a sample, which is high, you can see it's peak. If you get it super low, you can see the attrition number when it's just red from that uh, sequencing machine. And peak the level gets a number of 10 times the uh, minimum. So there's a possibility that it's actually taken to least size. 
So RAM will have some uh, can have some fault policies, but it never misses any. Means it never hits any fault policy. So yeah, I mean. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. So let's just see that if it is present in this. Uh, So these are like all the uh, files that we have that we have indexed. And uh, let's see. Okay, so uh, what I'm doing is like I have uh, got uh, the query uh, gamer with me and all the files that was written by the Rambo. So among all these uh, numerous files, we are just uh, have like handful of 10 or 12 files and we can actually uh, see that it is present in this file at this location. Now, uh, if you want to do a brute force search over this entire uh, repository, I mean, I can't even think about it, let me try. Uh, so, yeah, so. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, if you need a break, we can <laughs> head <laughs> So I mean, yeah, so I mean, I, I tried it kind of like goes for her because there are a thousand files and it takes like, uh, like a few minutes. Uh, so yeah, so few minutes against like one power minus five seconds is actually a huge deal and uh, can actually help in many uh, applications like cancer genomics and uh, phylogenics. Yeah. Great. Okay, I think I should stop it. <laughs> So yeah, uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, one second. Yeah. So basically, uh, so this was uh, an index on almost three trillion gamers that we just saw. Uh, we have some more numbers. Uh, and, uh, so for all the number of files from hundred to two thousand, we see that we have like two variants of Rambo. Uh, and each actually uh, achieves at least 10x more speed than the state-of-the-art method. So the state-of-the-art method COPS was the array of membership tester that I was talking about. There are two more uh, methods, SSBT and Howdy SBT, is actually uh, arranging these membership tester in tree. So the way we do binary search, it's how uh, this SSBT and Howdy SBT are doing. So in terms of uh, the memory and construction time, uh, the array of Bloom filters and the Rambo takes almost very similar memory, the slight overhead, because we have repetitions. Otherwise, uh, then any other method is actually uh, pretty less. So if we go for um, 1,000 files, 
which is approximately uh, like two to three terabytes, we actually go to like 23 GBs of the index. And yeah, uh, any questions, suggestions? Yeah. Thank you. Oh, so how did that affect the results as in how did it affect the, I mean, which? Oh, okay. So uh, so there are uh, different aspects. So on query time, uh, if we increase the K, let me just, uh, so K is the number of uh, files, uh, and uh, these, are, these are the K. Now, Oh, Kmer. Oh, oh, sorry. Okay, so uh, the Kmer size uh, actually. Um, so the thing is, if we have, if we choose a low number of uh, k, means less than uh, thirty-one, that means we can say that I would take an example. Uh, we choose k is equals to five, so k t c g c or something like that. Now that string uh, will have more probability to present in almost every set. I mean this. So the set cannot be uniquely identified. Now in that case, what happens is, if there are two sets, uh, the overlap is too much between these two, if we choose very less k. So if the overlap is too much, the distinctivity of the uh, set is not present. And what Rambo end, uh, ends up doing is, is actually uh, returning almost every set as the output. Now if we increase the k, uh, this distinctivity actually increases now, the thing is uh, that uh, we cannot keep increasing uh, because the the freedom that user has for querying a particular genome which can have a unique effect on the entire gene sequence gets reduces if we keep increasing the k. So that's why like k 31 is kind of like standard practice that, uh, that we use. Uh, we have low false positives. Oh. Yeah. And no false negatives. Oh, so, uh, I mean, the gold standard is, again, uh, good, good for search. So, we, we uh, yeah, yeah. So, So yeah, for this one we did good courses. Now in one cent terabytes creating a noted index because that's how we can create a gold standard uh, is kind of, uh, I would say, unimaginable and uh, cannot be done. Now in that case, what we can do is we can have a proxy of uh, measuring the performance. Now uh, we have four to the power 31 combinations of that. And uh, that means only we are, we are actually having a 31 length camer in the set. Now assume uh, we have a, a like a different set. I mean, say k is equal to thirty or k is equal to thirty-two or a, a, a round number, like a near number, which is not in the set because the length is different. Now we can actually manually insert them into each set, and uh, and then then check uh, if these gamers are present in that or not, and then uh, evaluate the performance. Uh, for for these ones, yeah. So for one seventy terabyte, uh, again that the way of measuring the false positive rate was one baseline we can measure with brute force, uh, and uh, the the. I mean for comparison with the baselines, 
I mean, they have actually reported their own false positives on a given index sizes. So with that particular index sizes, we have done the comparison. I mean, uh, at least for R, uh, we have, okay, it's not there, that one, but I can, uh, so in the paper, it almost take like for the entire one and terabytes, half a million files, takes less than 20 millisecond uh, to query. So yeah, I mean, uh, we, any suggestion, I mean, because there's plenty of room to improvement, uh, that's what I feel. Uh, we have not used any LSH. Uh, I mean, we talked about LSH, but we have not used LSH here. Uh, the groupings are random. Uh, so, I mean, if, if uh, instead of KMR, if, just, if we just edit one of the base pair, we can use a locally sensitive hash and then query. So even if, if it edits at one or two places, the LSH code will remain same. Yeah, so if we introduce LSH, then we start getting some false negative queries. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting idea, and then we see how long we can go into uh, using it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, if we just talk about one membership tester, then yes, it ties with the theoretical, uh, with the. But I mean, if we were talking about the variable length of sets here, so uh, it kind of like gives an expected or false positive rate that we derive. And uh, yeah, but I mean, like more or less similar, but uh, it's not directly aligned well because the set size is varying. I mean, reverse, reverse engineering is kind of like, so there are different performance metrics, the false positive rate, uh, how accurate the model is, the, the query time, the memory or the size is taken. So we have mathematically derived all this in the expert. Now uh, to reverse engineering means like we have to optimize one over the other. And what sort of thing that we choose, based on that we can actually say, okay, uh, we, can, we can optimize. Uh, so, I mean, that's kind of like a user specified or application specified optimization. Okay. Yeah, so with 100 terabytes, uh, so I mean, we need to see uh, uh, there are uh, obviously like. Uh, uh, application specific, uh, uh, like uh, application specifically, we can go. So, given 100 terabytes means even the KMRs are actually uh, in order of trillions or more, uh, more than that. Now, uh, each of this membership tester takes like uh, the order of insertion, and that's why we have some limitations on that. But if we just talk about a specific set of KMRs that we are interested in, now normally in uh, uh, in, in real world application, we want to quickly get if a very novel genome is present in that in the current database or not. So that is mostly the rare genome, which was no, never seen before. And this is what we need to include in the archive or we just want to specify in case of a test, I mean in layman terms, a, a, a test based on genome. So uh, if we omit all the frequent uh, KMRs and uh, just focus on the rare ones, we can actually bring it down a lot and not sure about the four gigabytes, but uh, yeah, I, th I think at least on a, on a laptop that we can, we can definitely see. Mm -hmm.
Ja, ja. Oh, no, okay. No, I see this. Right, right. I mean, so there's a trade-off. So, I mean, in membership cluster, the, the false positive rate and uh, the size actually get raised up. So we can we can actually have a slight trade-off. It can. So we saw there are like thousands of uh, files. It can at least be like 50 of them, and we are still happy with that. Yeah, they're like uh, cuckoo filters. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, Yeah, so I mean, uh, yes, we, uh, so there are like these uh, variants of counting room filters which can actually like, uh, because once we insert into the Rambo, we cannot delete it. That That's one thing. So, I mean, if we delete it, then they can be false negatives. Counting room filters are like one way where we can actually have deletion rate. Now, I'm not sure like which membership test that uh, is very specific to genomics. Uh, but yeah, like so, we can actually fit any membership tester here, and uh, all the properties of that membership tester, uh, in terms of query time uh, false positive rate and size, directly reflects to the Rambo. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Exactly. So yeah, membership test is kind of like a binary calculator. With with one set and accurate. Any more questions, suggestions? Yeah, uh, do check it out. Uh, and then, yeah, let me, I mean, Rambo, yeah, let me know if you have any questions. Oh, uh, I think. Yeah, please start if you like.